This is every Minecraft hack that feels like cheating. And hey, according to YouTube, no one's ever subscribed to the channel with the back of their finger. So if you're up to the challenge, whack the back of your index finger on that sub button below. It's free and it ups out a ton. On the surface, sand doesn't seem that important. I mean, it's irritating, it's coarse, and it gets everywhere. But ask anyone in the technical community, then sand gets pretty important. And most importantly, it's not renewable. And for how much sand we can start to need for big projects, and more importantly, other gravity blocks like concrete powder, then that's why we start to see duplication machines like this one, where we literally break the frames around the end portal just to get more of the stuff. But like most duplication in Minecraft, since there's no other way to farm this, that's where a lot of players start to see this as a gray area. And it seems like Mojang agrees, considering they haven't patched it out. And speaking of duplicators that Mojang's okay with, duplicating TNT in Minecraft is a glitch. There's no two ways to look at it. But considering the fact that there's no actual way to move TNT on top of flying machines, considering that in Java you can't move a dispenser, it's a container block, that's actually why Mojang's considered to leave this in for so long. Are they happy about it? Not really, but for some reason it's just not in the cards to get movable tile entities in Java. And while I can't say that I understand that one, I can't understand why some people would feel like this is cheating, because you're using one block of TNT that you crafted to get enough to blow up the entire world. That doesn't seem fair, but it is necessary in a lot of farms. With the help of the nether portal and a shield, we're able to give ourselves complete invincibility, at least as long as you don't eat food. Since the way that this works is that if you hold up your shield and then walk through the nether portal, then when you come into the next dimension, even though visually we're not holding up our shield anymore, the game still treats it like we are. And so, as long as we don't use any other things with the interact button, we're able to sprint and completely block all attacks that are coming towards us. Which could be helpful if you're not ready to tackle the nether just yet. For the price of an iron ingot and five planks, it gets a lot less scary to deal with those big ones. It's possible to get all of the illegal items that you'd only ever see in creative admin commands entirely in your survival world. The way we do this is actually through an April Fool's update. Since back in the one block at a time snapshot that Mojang did for April Fools, the Enderman could spawn holding illegal items. And while most of us would have just tried out that snapshot in a world that wasn't important, you are able to update that world like any other snapshot, meaning that you can then have this Enderman that's holding a structure block. Kill it, get it to drop its item, and now you've got something that you shouldn't even be able to have in the base game. And honestly, it's probably something that most players who are visiting your world wouldn't even recognize. That's how rare it is. But it also means you need to play this terrible snapshot, so I guess you did have to work for it in the end. Cauldrons are weird, and they're so weird in fact that they're actually able to break the logic of the game. See, if you were to take a cauldron and put it underwater, then you can fill it up with a lava bucket, and visually you'll have lava underwater literally at the bottom of the ocean. But that's not the strangest part, since if you were to actually step inside of the lava, then sure enough, even though the rest of us is encased in water, we're still able to burn to death in the bottom of that cauldron. And at that point, that's just embarrassing. It's kind of like stubbing your toe on a pillow. Probably technically possible, but everyone's gonna laugh at you if it happens. With the help of this machine, I'll never run out of items in my offhand. And the reason for this has something to do with a concept called item shadowing. Which, to grossly oversimplify, because I don't even frankly understand it all, the way that this works is that we're using some amount of update suppression with all these rails, to then trick the game to think that this item slot in this chest corresponds with the item slot that we're holding. And just like this, we'll never run out of rockets when we're exploring our world. At least, that's how Doc M used it on Hermitcraft, and I feel like that's a pretty practical application. But considering that update suppression's been passed out in the past, I think it's pretty obvious that Mojang's stance on this is that it's cheating, so more of a use it before you lose it kind of thing. Enchanting in Minecraft is not random, though all the steps that you have to do to manipulate it are gonna feel pretty random. See, it's possible to use third-party software like we can see here to then figure out the exact enchantment seed of your world. Just like your world has a seed to generate off of, it also has a seed for how your enchantments are gonna load. And once we crack that code, we can set it up where if you just throw out a couple of blocks like this, you get the exact enchantments that you want when using the enchanting table. And no matter how cool this is, I am gonna go out on a limb and say that if you're using third-party software to crack your game, that's probably not gonna be allowed on most servers. But it's completely possible, and it's not patched out, so take that as the hall pass, if you will. As you can see, I'm not in this boat. But even though that's easy to see, that's also not true. At least according to the server. See, when you stand on top of a boat like this and then right click it really, really fast, then it's possible to desync from the actual server and have it think that you're still inside of the boat while we're still able to walk around on our client. Why would you do this? Well, the interesting thing is, is that everything that we do while we're outside of the boat on our end is still gonna be processed even though we're inside of the boat on the server. So anything that we do while we're technically outside of the boat is eventually gonna update to the server, which means we build up a tall tower, jump off of it, take no fall damage, and then when we need to, hit shift and teleport right back 
back to the boat like we were supposed to be. Which is definitely weird, but it's also a really cool magic trick. So impress your friends if you can with this one. Well, plain version 1.8.9, if you were to look at an anvil sideways like this, then because of a glitch, that actually changes all other anvils in the world's collision boxes. So if we look at this sideways anvil and then walk backwards into a wall of anvils, we'll phase through as if there was no collision box whatsoever. And while I love how goofy this trick is to pull off, I also like imagining how goofy it must have been to discover this. And I would have loved to imagine how surprised someone was when they built a weird wall of anvils, only for it to get even weirder. Here's how to put more than 64 items into a stack. Or really, I should say 64 glass bottles. Since, as Raiseworks points out, the way that this happens is by using a brewing stand like this. And then, when you put 64 glass bottles in each of the three slots of the brewing stand, if you click them in order 1, 2, 3, you'll not just be holding 64 glass bottles in your hand, but rather, the second stack will bring you up to 127, and the third stack will bring you up to 190. But as cool as this is, it's also not anything permanent. Since you've already tried to put 190 glass bottles into one of the slots in your inventory from here, it'll just deposit 64 glass bottles at a time. But you could throw it outside of the UI menu, and it'll drop 190 on the floor, for whatever that's worth. Maybe you just want to take all the bottles of milk off the wall. I don't know. As Weefies demonstrates in this video, if you were to place blocks at the exact right height while you're falling, then you can actually trick the game into not registering any fall damage when you land. Now, the reason that this happens is that the game thinks that we're stepping onto the blocks instead of just falling onto them. And you wouldn't take fall damage if you were just stepping onto any regular block down here in the overworld, so nothing happens. But before you go get excited to try and learn this skill, I will warn, it doesn't work in newer versions. <laughs> I have a feeling if you tried it, it'd be a rude awakening even if you could get the timing down. By placing a piston underneath the end portal in a system like this, then when you push yourself with a piston, that'll get the game to teleport you to the end, but not to where we normally spawn on the obsidian platform. Rather, it just teleports you to the exact same coordinates of the overworld stronghold, which usually means that you can completely skip the ender dragon fight if you do this. Although the ender dragon might not be the only thing that you're missing out on, since when you do this, you'll usually just spawn above the void. So make sure that you have some kind of ender pearl or slow falling potion to help yourself out here. Otherwise, you'll have successfully built a machine just to lose your stuff in the end. What fun that is. Normally, a pig spawn is something that we only ever see with creative mode commands and spawn eggs. But on some seeds, it's possible to generate this quintuple pig spawner setup. And there's no cheats involved, but there definitely is a glitch. Since what happens here is that some other block overrides the NBT data of the spawner. And so it just defaults to the pig one. And then if you were to place down some well-lit grass blocks next to it, it actually does work. And you have a pretty solid pig farm, just nothing compared to a hogland farm. With the help of a boat and a flowing water source placed like this, we're able to drop ourselves completely through a sheet of bedrock. All we gotta do is place our boat right at the edge of the flowing water like so, and then jump in right before it exits frame. And honestly, this just feels so funny to me, because where it would be most useful is if you got trapped on top of the nether roof, but we can't place water over there, so you're really just stuck to using this in the overworld where it takes you to a short death. If you were to get yourself crouching down underneath a trapdoor like this, with a piston and a bunch of slabs around you, then when we flip the lever, that'll push the slab inside of our collision box, and we'll be able to see right down into all the caves below us. And then if you have something like Optifine Zoom or a Spyglass to help you find the finer details, this could help you to keep track of everything that's beneath you in your world, whether that's your friend's secret base or a dark patch that's given the hostile mobs a hiding place. Bedrock Edition's broken. I mean, that's not news to anyone who's ever played it, and we've definitely showcased that on this channel. But I think this particular glitch using Bone Meal can very easily show how some of the oversights are. Now, if you start off in a plains biome and Bone Meal the ground, you get grass and flowers. That much is expected. But then, when you Bone Meal some of that grass into tall grass, it doesn't always take the Bone Meal out of your inventory. And then, with a pair of shears, we can take that new tall grass and turn it into more bone meal and a composter, essentially giving us infinite bone meal, if you also have infinite time to get it. And if you were playing on something like Skyblock, this could be particularly useful. Getting on top of the nether roof is a useful tool in Minecraft, at least for those of us on Java. On Bedrock, you can't place anything. But on Java, we can build entire farms up here on the roof. So the question then is, how do we get up there? And really, all it's gonna take is finding yourself a little hole in the Bedrock roof like this, where you can get up as high as possible, to a Y level of 124. And then by placing down ladders and having yourself an ender pearl, we can squeeze our way up right to the top and then be able to throw our ender pearl right through the solid bedrock and land on top of the roof. Just make sure that you also brought some form of obsidian to help you out there. Like we mentioned, that bow trick from before, not gonna be your saving grace this time. But where a bow can be more useful is here in the overworld. It says if you go into third person and then angle your camera just right, then you'll notice that at the right angle, it's actually possible to see right through the water and everything will be completely clear. No filters, no darkness, just a clean shot of what you're looking for. And so if you're trying to scope out ocean ruins to get yourself a sniffer egg, or maybe a 
pirate ship to find yourself some buried treasure, this is a trick worth using. I mean, you're already in the boat anyways. It seems pretty good. Now in this video, we've already shown off more than a few ways to break the mechanics of Bedrock by phasing through it both up and down. But what if you just want to get rid of Bedrock entirely? And that's where a design like this one could come in handy. Now as Salmon Up lays out in this video, all we have to do is place two obsidian diagonally like so, and then with a piston and two blocks of TNT, we can align ourselves underneath this trap door and place our piston just right in the corner so that when the TNT blows up, we'll have successfully confused the game into thinking that the piston broke the bedrock. Just if you're doing this on the nether roof, make sure that you're doing this in the spot where the bedrock roof's only one bedrock thick. Since after all, there's nothing lamer than breaking bedrock, only to check underneath and there was more bedrock there. Duplication glitches always seem to find themselves into Minecraft, and some of them are just so strange that there's really no reason to fix them. At least, no good reason. And for that, I'd say this tripwire hook duplication glitch is one of them. Now here, we're using a design that Eagle Eye 621 have shown off in the past, where we basically place the tripwire hook on top of an iron trap door, and then when it gives off a redstone signal, it breaks and gives us two when we should have just gotten one. But before you think this is completely useless, I should point out that you can actually trade tripwire hooks for emeralds with villagers. And at that point, it's a lot easier to see the reason for building one of these. It just might also raise some eyebrows from your friends as they're wondering what in the world this contraption could be. Much more useful of a duplication glitch comes in the form of carpet. And no, not exactly for decorating your house, although I'm not gonna judge, but rather we're gonna be using this duplicated carpet as a means for fuel. Now, the idea here is pretty simple. We're using dead coral fans and slime blocks to duplicate our carpet, much in the same way that we've used it to duplicate TNT in the past. And then when you automate this system with a redstone clock, we can have that machine go back and forth and give us a whole bunch of carpet to flow into your furnaces. I hope you like the smell of burnt wool. Villagers are stupid, and you probably know that by trying to get their AI to move anywhere that you want them to. But there's no greater showcase of that than this example from Green's Hermitcraft world. Since if you trade with a cured librarian to get glass blocks, then we can craft those into glass paints and then sell them to a cartographer villager for profit. And if you're wondering just how crazy this can get, Green literally traded up from two pumpkins to a full emerald beacon, which I think is more than enough as a proof of concept. With the help of a bucket of powdered snow, we're able to turn this grass block into a glitched grass block only found in older versions. Now usually you can't see the top texture of a snowy grass block. It's covered by a snow layer, hence making it snowy. And if you break it off, it would usually become a grass block, but by placing powdered snow repeatedly on top of this grass block, then we can lag out the game in just a way where we're left with this silver grass block. But unfortunately, we can't pick it up. Silk Touch would just give you a grass block, and that's not exactly what we want. But if you want to show it off in your world, it definitely is cool. Do you know that shulkers aren't the only ones that are able to live in shulker shells? Sure enough, if we follow the lead of this Reddit post posted on the Glitches subreddit, then if we crawl into a tunnel and then position ourselves on top of a shulker box, then when we open up that shulker box, we're supposed to phase through it, but with a block underneath it, we're just gonna get stuck inside. Which looks very cool in first person, but for anyone in third person, it would just look ridiculous. So maybe don't let your friends see you trying this one out. With the help of a punch two bow, we're gonna be able to shoot ourselves right into the sky, quite literally. Since while playing on Bedrock Edition, it's possible that if you turn off friendly fire and then shoot a bunch of arrows into the sky, then once they land on your friend, they're not taking any damage from it, but they are still getting knocked up into the sky, giving you one of the cheapest and perhaps the stupidest elevators you can find in Minecraft. If you were to update an old 1.17 super flat world into the recent versions, then that increased world height that we're used to is gonna glitch it out, which essentially allows us to build blocks underneath the bedrock, which up until this point has never been possible. I mean, sure, we could drop things like shulkers and boats down into the void, but that's not building. This is. And it only takes one look at what Mog Swamp's been able to do with this with their ocean base to see that it's pretty cool, if not a little mind-bending to see something like this built under bedrock. Bedrock's bone meal isn't just broken for tall grass, but it's also broken for the flowers too. And here, all it takes to build yourself an AFK flower farm is just to hold down right click with a whole bunch of bone meal on this flower, since here it'll only grow more of the flower that you wanted to grow, instead of a bunch of ugly grass and stuff mixing it up, which I'd say is pretty nice. But if you try this on two tall flowers, you're just gonna get more of those two tall flowers popping off. When chiseled bookshelves were added in, they were also added with a duplication glitch. And the way that this worked is that once a chiseled bookshelf was filled up with books, then if you held down right click with a book of your choice, you could actually duplicate it. And since we can store our enchanted books inside of these bookshelves, that quickly became a way for us to get a whole bunch of mending, unbreaking three, you name it. And what's even more cursed is that this also allowed us to stack books into one item slot, which is something that historically, we've only been able to do with the grindstone and curse of binding books. I think this is a lot more useful in both cases. When you're looking for materials in Minecraft, you're gonna have to branch mine a couple times. And while that's fine, it doesn't always feel like the fastest. But lucky for you, there might be a way to fix that. The way that it works in Minecraft, you actually 
actually mine faster when you mine at max reach distance instead of right up close. Taking that into consideration, maybe take a couple of steps back and save yourself some time. After all, if you're gonna be digging into straight line for a while, why not at least shave off some seconds where you can? And while I can't guarantee this will improve your luck finding diamonds, I can at least say it'll help you find out faster. This is one of the fastest ways to kill the wither, and you don't even need a sword to do it. That's right, by using just the bedrock in the end and some high explosion power fireworks, you can spam those underneath and kill the wither in just a matter of seconds. Just make sure to spawn it in like this so that it gets stuck inside the bedrock. Otherwise, this method won't be nearly as effective. But do it right and we'll get ourselves our nether star in 10 seconds flat, all without taking any damage ourselves. Opening a chest next to piglins is a dangerous gamble, and breaking it doesn't work either. So instead, place a hopper underneath the chest and then wait for all the items to pour out. See, the piglins don't care if you open the hopper, so you can enjoy all of the riches that they drip feed out of the chest. And then, after that chest is empty, why not trade all of the gold that you found inside back to the piglins? That way, they get to keep their gold, and we get to stay on their good side. In Bedrock Edition, it's possible to jump six blocks high without using any potion effects. Simply have your friend hold up a shield and then punch them repeatedly. Because if you have a wall behind you for support, you can use that knockback to launch yourself right up to the ceiling. And if you both have a shield on hand, you could each switch back and forth and use this to effectively climb up to build limit. Just make sure you don't punch them when their shield's down, or this whole thing could fall apart, literally. Using waterlogged leaves, we can see through walls. And here's how. If you're on bedrock, first dig a canal of water, fill it up with leaves, and then go beside them and till the soil with a hoe. And by doing this, we get exactly one pixel of window to see through the world. And it would seem that the reason this works is because the game doesn't render blocks that the player can't see. And since the water inside is supposed to be invisible from all sides, it's not actually rendered. Though it doesn't recognize that we tilled the soil next to it, so we do get a sneak peek through the glitch like so. I think every kid's wanted to be a spy at some point. I mean, why else would there be so many different spy items available at book fairs? It's supply and demand, folks. So while I'm not saying you'll become a full James Bond in Minecraft, this might at least put you one step closer. Secret messages are a classic bit of spy technology, but even when you use the message command, that isn't always secure. So if that's the case, let's turn to invisible ink, otherwise known as nether hyphae. Now laid out on the ground, these don't look like much, but give your friend a map and now it's a hidden message. No matter where you go in the world, you've got yourself a private messaging app. And better yet, the server mods will be none the wiser. Stop building your cobblestone generators like this, but rather build it like this. As you'll notice, by using a waterlogged stair instead of a water source block, we get a few benefits. Namely, you can't accidentally create obsidian since the water doesn't flow out of the back of the stair. And even though this has been marked on the bug tracker, it's been open for years, so I'm not that worried about it getting patched soon, if at all. You see, when you waterlog something, it keeps the properties of a water source block, meaning that just by pouring a water bucket on your chest, that sucker isn't gonna explode anytime soon. I see that as a small price to pay for indestructible chests. This is a lot easier to clean up. Before you visit the deep dark, you probably want to brew up a slow falling potion. As Simply Sark points out, chugging one of these can help us get around the Skulk Shriekers and Sensors without setting them off. I mean, you could fall from any height and land on a block next to it, and as long as you're not moving side to side, you will not set off any of the sensors, making this indispensable to have. Oh, or give slow falling to the mobs that you're trying to pull on a lead, and that way you can fly around with them on an elytra without having to worry about them dying of fall damage when you reach your destination. By this point, we've talked about making a bubble elevator using kelp, which is helpful, but it requires a couple of different items. So instead, let's get the job done simpler by just carrying around ice. With this, all we have to do is pillar up ice above a soul sand block and then mine it with a non-silk touch pickaxe on the way back down. Then when we reach the bottom, all of them will be water source blocks and we can fly right back up to the top, keeping our elevators fast and helping us build them about as quickly. Instead of using six planks to craft a shield, why not use five and craft yourself a bow? Now, as crazy as it seems, a bow can actually be very useful for defense. Like in this situation, where if we were to fight the Enderman by ourselves, we probably wouldn't fare too well. But if we place it in a boat beforehand, then as soon as we start attacking it, it won't even teleport away. And it can't hit us. I mean, the boat is so strong that if you were to put an exploding creeper in your backseat and row the boat, you'll barely take any damage when it explodes. And as much as I love shields, you can't exactly say the same for them. So if you're already crafting one of these to get across the seven seas, it's worth keeping in your hotbar to get you out of a sticky situation. Honey blocks are great for redstone traps and traps without redstone. Let me explain. With the honey blocks unique properties, if any mob stands on top of it, they can't easily jump over. Which means that if we were to put a mob or a villager inside of a compost or a cauldron with a honey block underneath, they're not able to jump out. And just like that, we found the sticky situation that'll keep your villagers inside of the trading hall. And to go one step further, add an extra ring of honey blocks around them, and then any baby zombies can jump in to try to kill the mob as well. That way we make sure we keep the mob safe and sound, all while they stay put. This trick will help you find buried treasure
treasure every single time. Because instead of trying to guess where the X means on the map, if you instead line yourself up and then use the F3 debug screen to move to where the chunk info line has a nine in the first and third spots, then if you dig straight down, you'll be right on top of the chest. Which is particularly useful if the chest happens to spawn out on the water next to the shoreline. Because digging around aimlessly is already a time waster. We don't need to make that any worse by having to dig slower underwater. If you've ever tried to get a skeleton hit a creeper, then you know it's not an easy task. But it's a necessary one if we want to fill out our music disc collection. So we'll have to get creative. And luckily, this user has the right idea. See, Minecraft counts assists the same way that it does kills. Meaning, if we have a skeleton shoot a piece of TNT, ignite it, and then that kills the creeper, we'll get the music disc the same way. Simple as that. If you have only three dirt blocks, you're rich. Or at least, richer than you might think. Since if you have three dirt blocks, it's actually possible to trade that up to an emerald. Now, the way that we do this in 1.19 is that we turn our dirt into mud, using a water bottle, and then dry it out on a dripstone rack like such to get ourselves our very own clay blocks. Which, if we then break, we can trade with a stonemason to get ourselves an emerald. It's not exactly the fastest trade, but it's definitely possible. And this proves that even when you're dirt poor, you're still not as poor as you think you are. While the swift sneak enchantment is meant to help out down in the ancient cities, it can also be useful above ground for when you're trying to speed bridge. And looking at this comparison between no swift sneak and swift sneak 3, you can really see that there's a massive difference. And honestly, I'm just glad that there's a method now to speed bridge without ever learning how to speed bridge. Because if you're like me, I could never get down the timing. Looting is one of the quintessential enchantments in Minecraft, which means it's a bummer when it's only limited to swords. Or so you'd think. You see, if you chuck your looting three sword to your offhand slot, then you can use something like a bow and still have the enchantment applied. And from where I'm standing, that's all upsides, folks. Not only do you save from damaging your prized weapon, but you also gain a bunch of range. Sure, you still do have to walk in close to collect the items, but look at the alternative. If you're asking if I'd rather walk up to a creeper and fight it, or just pick up a pile of gunpowder, I think the choice is clear. Let's say you built a path up to your base using gravel, but later on you decided that andesite would actually work better for the build. So how do you replace it? Do you go through that whole path removing every piece of gravel and then place andesite into the empty holes? Because if you're doing that, you're wasting time. Rather, what you should be doing is if you have an insta mine tool and then the block you want to replace in your offhand, every time that you hit left click and right click at the same time on a block, you're able to instantly replace it with the block that you want to use, helping you clean up those mistakes without any extra headache. Starting a farm is often a big undertaking. So whether you got that potato from a zombie drop or it's the only one you have left over from a village trip, the fact still stands that you're gonna need a lot more of those things to get the farm going. So to help out on that, that Fortune 3 tool that you got in your hotbar isn't just good for lapis and diamonds. No, it can actually increase your crop yield as well. Sure, just how much that increases averages out to just be about one more per block, but Folks, as you grow to a big farm, that can add up really fast, giving you more spuds to plant and more to Fortune 3 down the road. Let's face it, minecarts aren't very fast, which is a shame because roller coasters are a ton of fun. So instead of a normal railway, place your rails like this for an extra speed buff. Now it might look silly and the travel animation's definitely unique to say the least, but the speed boost that we can achieve more than makes up for it. You don't even need powered rails to do it. And honestly, the slowest part of the process might just be figuring out how to build all those weird circles, but trust me, it'll pay off. Instead of using boats, why not use dolphins? Crazy as it sounds, if you get a dolphin onto a lead, you can enjoy Enjoy the dolphin's grace buff for however long your journey is. And to get even more out of this trick, try wearing some Death Strata 3 boots to give you that extra speed right across the seven seas. Because with just those two things, we can start to travel over 36 blocks per second. Just like that, you travel two chunks every second that passes by. That's some serious speed. Nobody likes waiting. Whether it's waiting in line, waiting for files to download, or a video to buffer, nobody likes their time wasted. Which largely makes nether portals a pain to deal with. In survival mode, not only do you have to wait for the whole sickness animation to play out, but then you've also got to let an entire other dimension load on the other side. It's not exactly speedy, to say the least. But if you've got some items, we might be able to cut that down. You see, by using nether portal chunk loading, all it takes is throwing an item to the other side, and then all of a sudden, it'll do all of the loading for you. So going forward, maybe take the time and hit the Q key. Might just save you some down the road. If you're having trouble finding the dead coral for a TNT duplication machine, don't sweat it, just use glass. No joke, even though it's a less popular way of performing this glitch, all it takes is a setup like so using observers to make an equally effective TNT duplication machine. And you might find this could be even more effective on a skyblock world, where coral isn't exactly close by. And in any case, it's just nice to be able to build one of these without having to need silk touch right away. If you want to be a pro at Minecraft, then you gotta be able to MLG clutch. But if your reaction time's like mine, then that's disconcerting. It's just not gonna happen. So a simpler option for us slow pokes is to use coarse fruit instead. Strangely enough, 
the random teleport feature is actually predictable, or at least predictable enough for us to use. The way it works, it will always teleport you to solid ground. So if you're in midair off a of shulker's levitation effect, then you can just chomp on one of these and be teleported right back to safety. And look, I'm not gonna lie, it maybe doesn't look as cool as a water bucket safe, but being able to survive a deadly fall, I think that's good enough for me. Looting desert temples is a fun pastime for sure, but what if you're trying to get the valuables without wasting your precious time? Well, that's where this method comes in. See, while most of us would just spend the seconds to individually loot each and every one of these chests, this user's method is a lot more straightforward. And instead, we use the TNT from the trap below to blow up the chamber and the chest with it. And while that sounds dangerous, it's worth noting that by standing in the pit down here, it'll let us survive with barely a scratch sustained. And afterwards, we'll not only have all that treasure in our inventory, but a ton of blocks to build our way out as well. Who doesn't love roller coasters? No one I want to hang around with, that's for sure. And it's because of this mutual love of roller coasters that I'm sure we've all tried to set up a thrill ride once or twice. But the real test is what your friends think, though it's pretty boring to just set them off and wait till they get back. So to make that journey a bit more inclusive, why not upgrade your ride? You see, since minecarts can pick up entities and boats happen to be entities, you can essentially make a two person cedar minecart to ride the rails. So not only do you get a goofy ride to go around in, but you can also build up some surprising propulsion by rowing the boat, which I think we all can agree are pretty great things. If you've only got yourself one bucket of water, but you still need an infinite water source, just wait for nighttime. Since if you kill a skeleton and get some bone meal, then you can use that to create seagrass, which if you grow seagrass inside of flowing water, it'll turn that into a full water source block. So whether you're playing in a desert on a skyblock island, or you just don't want to craft another bucket, a bit of bone meal will solve your problem just the same. I think we all can agree the channeling enchantment's pretty great. For one, not only is it fun to summon lightning like your last name is Odinson, but that very lightning allows you to change and manipulate different mobs. So when you're fed up with typical mushrooms and you're looking for a change, well, bam. It's great, but obviously all that lightning can get pretty dangerous. So if you're trying to do your magic without all the pain of electrocution, maybe try this. You see, by placing down an item frame, all you have to do is zap that and the job gets done the same way. Except this time, no one's getting hurt in the process. Which is nice, because really, there's no point in converting a corpse. Endermen aren't always the easiest to kill. And while the teleporting might be fine in a desert or a plains biome, when you're fighting them in the end, the last thing you want is to get sneak attacked. So to cut their magic show short, all we need is five planks and a plan. After we craft a boat, all we need to do is place that right down next to an enderman, and that sucker will be locked right into place. No joke, as long as you don't break the boat, you're free to slice, dice, and slay the foe with no hassle to you. I mean, they do still have pretty massive arms, so I wouldn't recommend getting too close to the bash zone, but as long as you keep you and your axe out of harm's way, then I think you'll find this works pretty well. The new nether stem blocks are a great addition, except for when you're trying to smelt something. Unlike regular logs, these can't be used as fuel in a furnace. They don't burn to a flint and steel, so why should a furnace be any different? But this intentional piece of game design might just have an unintentional workaround. If instead you take those logs out of the furnace and into a crafting grid, then we can craft them into sticks, which by themselves would work Work as a fuel source, but we can actually do one better. Folks, by crafting those very sticks in the ladders, now we're actually getting the best bang for our buck when it comes to smelting, which I've got to say is a big improvement when the alternative was not smelting anything at all. Redstone is one of my favorite parts of Minecraft, but the circuitry isn't exactly a looker. Now, that doesn't discount its personality. I'm sure what's on the inside counts, but to our builder friends, it's all about outward appearances. So in that case, how about we find ourselves a happy middle ground? I wasn't aware of this until recently, but you can actually throw down item frames on top of redstone dust. Meaning, if you add in a colored map of your choice, then you can effectively cover up your tracks. Now, obviously, if you're using a bunch of these item frame and map combos, I do have to warn of some potential lag. But if you got yourself a beefy computer, then I'd be hard pressed to say this isn't worth a shot. Anvil costs can get annoying pretty fast. I mean, all it takes is a few enchanted books in the wrong order, and bam, it's too expensive to use. And this can get remarkably frustrating when you go to repair something. So before you find yourself in that hassle, maybe try this. Apparently, by just renaming the tool every time you go to repair, it's enough to stop the repair cost from jacking up each time. At that point, the game treats it as a simple name change operation and forgets the rest. Just some minor change like adding a space or a number to the end is good enough. It does not need to be fancy, trust me. Or if you're not a fan of loud noises, these azalea bushes can also keep monsters at bay. Because of the way that the mob's pathfinding AI works, they can jump over azalea bushes. But obviously, we can do that just fine. So if you're looking for a prettier alternative to the carpet and fence trick, this hedge maze is definitely worth a shot. And thankfully, these don't automatically grow into azalea trees, meaning that this fenceless defense is here to stay. And with that, folks, YouTube thinks that you might like this video. So see if they're right and have a good one, all right?